What's up, Cornerstone? Good morning. Yeah. I don't know who's cheering for me. I'm new here. My name is Landon, one of the pastors. Thank you to Pastor Lynn and Lisa and Marty and Eric and Stephanie, everybody on the leadership team. You guys got an awesome leadership team here. They've been very welcoming to me. Um, man, it's hot. I mean, they said that, but... I'm from Chicago. Go Cubs. <laughs> in Chicago, people pay money to go sit in a sauna. Just think about that. If that's what you want, you're, you're crushing it here. Whole area is a sauna, free of charge. Sit outside. <laughs> I brought a picture of my wife and kids I wanted to show you. Um, because they're awesome, and also because, honestly, like people tend to listen to me a bit more when they see a picture of my wife. <laughs> they see me, they're like, eh, they see her, they're like, okay, well, let's give this guy a shot. Let's see what he's got. And that's our kids. Ezra is four, Violet is two, Julian River is our little baby. We love him. He's just about to turn one. He's probably crying somewhere right now. <laughs> Thank you guys for welcoming me here talking about the book of First Peter, Peter had kind of a unique take on a lot of stuff. He was kind of that guy in the crew, just had a bit of a unique way of looking at life and doing things. All the disciples were hanging out in a boat in John 21, and Jesus was walking on the beach, and they all saw him, and they were like, oh, let's row over to see Jesus. And Peter just jumped out of the boat and swam he just had a unique way of looking at things and doing things. Another different time, they were in a boat. I, I, I'm sure you know this story. And Jesus just comes out walking on the water. And all the disciples are like, uh, it's a ghost. Peter's like, hey, Jesus, tell me to do that. He just had this unbelievable way of looking at life and looking at things. And then all of a sudden, God got a hold of his heart, and the Holy Spirit indwelt this crazy guy, and he just started rocking the world for the Lord. And his unique perspective became informed by and then inspired by the Holy Spirit, and we get to study this awesome content in these letters that he wrote thousands of years later. He gives us his unique take on everything. It reminded me of this thing I had when I was a kid. It was a lenticular trading card. Did you ever have anything like that? It's uh, one of those trading cards where the guy's like holding the bat like this and then you turn it and he's like swinging. You can kind of see it two different ways. You remember those? I found this cool image of a lenticular art piece. You look at it one way and it's a, a rabbit and you look at it the other way and it's the inside of the rabbit. It's a concept of a lenticular image, something that you can look at two different ways. The book of 1 Peter gives a lenticular look at a lot of different topics. Holiness, this is how God looks at it. This is how people look at it. Marriage, this is how the world looks at it. This is how Christians look at it. Just a different take on things. Here in 1 Peter chapter 5, which is where we're going to be looking this morning, go ahead and grab your Bible and open it. He gives us a lenticular look at the concept of the mind, the Christian mind, how it's supposed to work. He's got a different take on it. He's got a different perspective on it. Wouldn't be a good sermon about mental and emotional health if I didn't start with a bunch of statistics meant to scare you, right? To listening? No? Okay, well, I'll do it anyway. How about this one? 90% of people are are gonna struggle with anxiety at some point in their life. 40% of people go on an anti-anxiety medication at some point in their life. 30% of those people will abuse said medication. Get this one. 40% of people 
admit to worrying every day. Now, I did make up all of those statistics. <laughs> but like, you guys were just gonna go with it. You're like, oh wow, yeah, okay. And that's the point that I'm trying to get across as we start today, which is that this is like a real issue in society, but not just in society, in our homes, not just in our homes, in our own minds. In fact, I've been doing ministry for about 10 years and I've noticed a dramatic shift in the primary thing that people are looking for, advice, information, and content about. When I first started in ministry, the, mo the, the, the primary thing people were asking about was, was sexual issues, issues of sexuality. And I've seen a dramatic shift in Christianity in the last 10 years, people desiring information, help, guidance, and content about mental health and emotional health as a Christian. How amazing that God knew that we would need it and inspired this content that we can study today. First Peter chapter five goes into and gives us three ways to be healthy in our mind as a Christian. Are you ready for that? If you're ready for it, say, I am ready. If you're, if you're at 1 Peter chapter five, say, preach. preach. Let's do it. 1 Peter 5, 6 says this. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he might lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Peter's given us his unique perspective on how to have a healthy mind. Let's look at some of those words in the passage. It says the word humble first. Do you see that in your Bible? Humble is a physical word. It means to lower. It means to get low. Get physically low under God's mighty hand. I've heard uh, Pastor Stephen Furtick say, everybody wants 1 Peter 5.7, but how many people want 1 Peter 5.6? Everybody wants to be free of anxiety, but how many people want to humble or lower themselves under God's mighty hand? I love what he says in verse seven. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Anxiety just means the things that weigh us down, the things that worry us, the things that stress us out. But I doubt you needed someone to define anxiety for you. I love that word cast. Do you see that in your Bible? It's not a polite word, it doesn't mean like pass. It's not saying like, hey, fold up your anxieties and hold them up in the air and God will take them. It's more of a messy word, it means to throw. Throw your anxieties onto God's shoulders. I love this concept. Get rid of it, throw it onto him. The problem is, that isn't what we wanna do. If you struggle with anxiety like I do, you know that when you feel anxious about something, when you feel worried, the last thing you wanna do is throw it away. You wanna keep it, you wanna hold it, you wanna mess with it, you wanna manipulate it, you wanna fix it, and you really start to trust yourself even though you have a bad track record of accomplishing that task. <laughs> In fact, if you struggle with anxiety, the last thing you wanna do is get rid of it because you feel like the safest place for the things that worry you are in your heart. Peter is giving us a unique perspective, a new perspective, a God perspective, and it's so much better. Have you learned, Christian, that worry doesn't work? Doesn't work. When was the last time you were like, man, I had a problem, I worried about it, and it was gone. <laughs> but that's what we do. Peter's given us something better, something different, something new. God's way. Don't worry about it. Don't hold on to it. Don't try to mess with it. Don't try to fix it. Don't try to control it. Throw it on God's shoulders and he'll take care of it. The way I wrote it down was this. The lie that we believe is that controlling our anxieties is freedom. The truth is, throwing them on God is freedom. We think if we control it, we'll be free, but it's not true. When we give it up, that's when we're truly free. And this Content is all throughout scripture. It says in Psalm 55, 22, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. It's the same exact idea. Throw it on God's shoulders and he'll take care of it. We're gonna get three things out of the text this morning about healthy minds. And the first one is this, a healthy mind through casting. 
If you'd like to write things down, write that down. A healthy mind through casting, through throwing, through getting rid of the stuff. Been using this app. It's called Headspace. Anybody else use that app? Oh, it's remarkably unpopular. <laughs> <laughs> it's a meditation app. I really like it. It's uh, this dude, he's got like a really cool accent and uh, he just like tells you to calm down and stuff. It's like the kind of thing you could get for free if you call your mom, but <laughs> you pay him to do it. And as I've been using, it's cool. It's, a, it's an app. It teaches you about mindfulness. It teaches you about being calm. It's cool Christian concepts, but it comes through this kind of secular psychology. And the thing that's interesting about it as I've been using this app is this guy ends up saying things that the Bible says, but he comes at it from a totally different angle. It's like, he'll be like, you know, don't hold on to the things that bother you and irritate you. Like, th like throw them, like get rid of them. And I'm like, man, like I just, I just paid you to tell me something that the Bible already told me. Like how, ma how much time and energy and resources have gone into secular psychologists studying the brain to find out that the things that the Bible already said are true. <laughs> like, it's so cool, isn't it? Like, God already gave it to us, how to be healthy. I had a friend who was moving out of town, and he, um, <laughs> he told me he wanted to sell me his weights, and I thought, that's really an insult when you think about it. <laughs> and he was selling, like, his dumbbells and a bench and, all, and a cage and all this stuff, and I, he was like, I'll give you a really good price. I don't want to deal with all the Craigslist stuff, and... I was like, all right, yeah, I'll buy it. So I bought it from him and I can see it on your faces now. You're thinking, did, did you buy it or did you use it? <laughs> the thing that you learn when you, when you lift, when you work out, when you train, is that no matter how big you get, no matter how cut you get, no matter how ripped you get, no matter how fit you get, no matter how big the circumference around your biceps becomes, there's certain things that you're just never strong enough to lift. There's certain things that no matter how much you train yourself, no matter how cut you get, you're never going to be able to lift it. What Peter's saying is the exact same thing. He's saying there's some things that your mind just is never meant to or made to. It's never, you're never going to be able to lift it. Those anxieties, those worries that you hold on to, you weren't made to lift those, and no matter how much you try, you'll never be able to do it. God's giving us a better way. He's saying, instead of trying and failing again, throw them on my shoulders and I will take it for you. But I didn't even talk about the best part of the verse yet, because what does he say after that? Why? Why are we supposed to do that? Because, God says, I care for you. I love it. God's promising something that no person is capable of delivering on. Your spouse can sit with you and listen to the things that stress you out, but they're incapable ultimately of holding all of that for you. They can do their best and they can try and God bless them for doing so, but they can't do what God can do. Your roommate, your boss, your friend, your small group leader, they can sit with you and they can listen to you. But ultimately, they're incapable of doing what God is offering to do for you. And not only is he offering to hold all of your anxieties on his shoulders, he's asking you to throw them on his shoulder. Not only is he asking you to do it, he's telling you while you do it that he cares for you. How amazing is that? Talk about a one-sided relationship. If God's stirring in your heart to have a healthy mind, this is one of the ways that we get there. By not holding on to these anxieties by throwing them on God's shoulders. What does the text say next? A healthy mind through casting. We're gonna see something different in the next verses here. Let's look at verse eight together. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the whole world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. He says you can have a healthy mind through casting of anxiety. Now he's gonna talk about something different. He's not talking about anxiety anymore. He's talking about temptation. He's talking about the things that the devil, the enemy, brings into your mind and how to deal with it in a healthy way as a Christian. He says this concept, be sober-minded. Do you see that there in your Bible? 
I know when we hear the word sober, we think of drinking. I brought a bottle of Jack Daniels to illustrate this. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the concept of a sober mind is a, is a great concept. It's, it's the concept of having a clear mind. Clear mind that's informed by scripture, a cloudy mind that's not informed by scripture. A sober mind is a clear mind. He says, be sober minded, be clear minded, be watchful. Why? Because there's an enemy and he's trying to eat you. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter says the best way to describe the enemy, the devil, in this context is that he's like a lion. I've got a picture of a lion to show you guys. Lions are scary. Any Animal Planet fans in the house? Yeah, Planet Earth. I like that stuff. And, man, lions are scary, dude. Uh, when you start like learning about them, they're even scarier. Do you know that lions can run 50 miles per hour and they can jump 36 feet? The Bible says that Satan is like a roaring lion. Lion roars can be heard five miles away. Isn't that crazy? Lions eat everything, can even eat elephants. The thing you learn when you learn more about lions is, like, lions can be defeated, like you can shoot one, but lions don't die of their own accord. In fact, you'll never hear about a lion who dies of hunger. Like, it's going to find something to eat or someone and the point of what the text is talking about is saying, man, this, this lion, this enemy, the devil, he's walking around. He's looking for something or somebody to eat. Don't let it be you. Well, how? How do you not let it be me? You resist. When you have anxious thoughts, you throw them on the Lord's shoulders. When you have thoughts of temptation, you do something different. You resist. I like how clear that is. A healthy mind through casting, a healthy mind through resisting. Read an interesting story on the internet about a guy named Ted Pelkey from Westford, Vermont, small town, 2,000 people. He was an interesting guy. He was kind of like a blue collar guy. He worked in a garage, he owned a garage, fixed cars, stuff like that. He had this idea, he wanted to work from home so he was gonna build his garage on site at his house so he could do all the work at his house. So he cooked up these plans for an 8,000 square foot garage. And he was like, I'm gonna build this on my property, it's gonna be amazing. Lived in a small town, he's like, I'll just take the plans over to the city government and we'll get them approved and I'll build this garage. City government says no, and he's like, dang it. So he tries again, you know, messes with the plans, whatever he did, goes over there, asks again, they say no again. This guy wouldn't give up, though, on his garage. Ended up going back and forth to the same city government for 10 years, trying to get this 8,000 square foot garage approved. And they said no every single time to Ted. So Ted was like, all right, I'll build something different. So he spent $4,000 and built a 700 pound wooden middle finger. and he put it 16 feet up on a pole where the garage was supposed to be built. And he lived next to the highway. It's his message to the people who kept saying no to him. Now, I know that in a Christian service, our friend Ted would not typically be used as a role model, <laughs> not condoning what he did, although I am a fan of it in a comedic sense. <laughs> when it comes to sending a message, Ted's really onto something. <laughs> I'm serious. When it comes to saying, I'm done with that, I'm over that, it's done, Ted's really done us a favor and shown us how to do something 
Did you know that you're a blood-bought son or daughter of Jesus Christ if you've made a commitment to follow him? Do you know that the enemy has no power over you other than the power that you would give back to him? Do you know that Jesus Christ purchased your freedom at the price of his own life? Do you know that you, through the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells in your heart, have the power, the capability, and the will through the Spirit to resist the devil? But how many Christians actually view themselves like that? Do you know when the Bible says resist the enemy, you actually have the power in you to do so? First Peter is telling us, man, pull a Ted, like resist, like, <laughs> I didn't think this would be this funny. I was trying to say something spiritual. When you have those thoughts of temptation, the thing as a Christian, man, is it's just like, all we want to do is like hold on to it and ruminate on it and meditate on it and think about it and look at it and be like, what if? And the Bible is saying, if you want to be healthy, if you want to have a healthy mind, don't entertain the thoughts of temptation, resist them. And I'm telling you that the Holy Spirit in you, if you're a follower of Christ, already has given you the power and capability of doing so. That's what I was trying to say. Let's look back at the text. A healthy mind through casting, cast your anxieties on the Lord. A healthy mind through resisting, resist temptation. And then a healthy mind through waiting. That's what we're gonna see through verses 10 and 11, mainly verse 10. It says this, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory after you've suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong and make you firm and make you steadfast. There's a lot of cool stuff in here. The first thing is there's this juxtaposition between suffering and glory. He offers these two time phrases. He says, you're gonna suffer for a little while, but... The God of grace has called you to an eternal glory. Do you see the comparison he's making there? As a Christian, you might suffer. You probably will, but suffering will be temporary, but glory will be forever. I've heard it said that for a Christian, earth is the worst it'll ever get, and for a non-Christian, earth is the best it'll ever get. And we might suffer here a little bit, as Christians, but the suffering is for a little while and the glory is forever. And then the best part of the verse, he will himself do four things for you. He will restore you. That word means to refresh, to refurnish, to renew. He will make you strong. He will make you firm. He will make you steadfast. That word steadfast is awesome. It's a construction word. The concept there is of laying a foundation that's firm and strong that you can stand on, that you can trust. But the best part of the verse isn't even those four words. It's the thing that comes before it because it says not that he will do it for you through someone else. What does it say? It says that he himself will do it. I love it. God isn't going to delegate this task of caring for you. God isn't going to delegate this task of helping you. He isn't gonna ask an angel or a small group leader or a friend to do it. He says, I myself will do it. God doesn't outsource caring for his kids. He said, I'll do it. Oh man, I love that. You know why I love it? because I do this all the time, Christians do this all the time, we get in the way of what God's trying to do. We read a verse like that and we're like, cool, so what is it gonna look like for me this week to establish the foundation of my life? And God's like, no, 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 dude, read the verse. You're not supposed to do it, I'm doing it. Just get out of my way and let me do it. And I love it because, you know, so often we come to church and the thing that we leave with is something that we have to do, something that we have to believe, something we have to think, something that we have to do. And you don't have to do anything for this. In fact, if you do anything, you'll probably make it worse. The best thing to do with this verse is literally nothing and to just let God do the work that he's already trying to do in you. He's like, I'm gonna do it and I'm not gonna delegate it. I'm gonna do it myself. The thing is though, is that it takes time. That's what he's saying. After you've suffered a little while, it's gonna take a minute. I'm working on you. It's gonna take a minute. 
If you'll allow me a cooking metaphor, we all had the experience growing up of delicious hot cookies being made in an oven and our desire for them superseding our ability to be patient. Hot oven, hot pan, hot cookies. Mom says, mitts off, paws off, it's not done. Peter's saying, God's cooking you and he's not done yet. Just let him do his thing and don't mess it up. I love that. I love that the thought that you could walk out of this room knowing and believing that God's doing a work in you that you have to let him do. A healthy mind through casting, through throwing of anxiety. A healthy mind through resisting temptation. And a healthy mind through waiting. Which is hard. It's not fun to wait. Everybody in the Bible did it. Abraham had to wait for Isaac. Isaac had to wait for Rebecca. Jacob had to wait for everything. <laughs> David had to wait to be king. Israel had to wait for the promised land. Jesus had to wait 30 years to go into ministry. Waiting is a part of the thing that you signed up for if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. It's not easy but at least during it, you know that he's working and he's making you into something if you let him do it. I had heard a crazy story on the internet about a guy named Lawrence John Ripple. Looks like a bit of a nut, honestly. He's actually here with us in the service. Here, come on forward. No, I'm just kidding. Can you imagine, I like put up the picture, you guys laugh, then we bring him up on stage. I'm like, come here, man, let's pray for you, bud. We love you here. <laughs> it's a story about, he had some marriage problems. It's a story about like manipulating and messing with things. This is like what we're talking about here. So Lawrence decided to rob a bank. And he went into the bank uh, with a piece of paper that said, I have a gun, give me money. And he handed a note to the teller Teller gave him $3,000 in cash. And to everyone's surprise, he, he didn't leave the bank. He just took the money and he went and stood in the lobby. And everyone was like, what are you doing? And then he just sat down and waited. And then the police came and arrested him. And then they looked at the note that he wrote and handed to the teller and it said, I would rather be in prison than at home with my wife. <laughs> Classy guy. Now, I don't know if the judge was like a masochist or a comedian or what. You can look this story up, it's real. The judge sentenced Lawrence to home confinement. <laughs> with his wife. Like, man, if you thought she was bad before, just wait till she reads what you wrote on that piece of paper, man. <laughs> it's a great illustration of what I'm talking about. What I'm trying to get across, the point I'm trying to get across is that God's always doing things and he's always teaching us things and he's always showing us things and he's teaching us how to have a healthy mind. And so often we get in the middle of what he's already trying to do. Like, he's like, give your anxieties to me. And you're like, no, 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 I got it. I'm a Christian, like, I'm gonna like fix it. And he's like, like, what? like, just give it to me. Stop, just, when has worry ever worked? And you're like, no, 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 no I got it. And uh, just messing with it for no reason, not even, just makes it worse. Then it comes to temptation and instead of resisting, we like look at it and meditate on it and ruminate on it. And God's like, man, like, just resist. And then we get these promises of God and we're like, oh my gosh, like I've been waiting for like two years for this thing and it hasn't happened. And God's like, just give it a minute. I'm doing something. Just wait. And we're like, my mind is so unhealthy. And God's like, man, I love you. I'm teaching you how to do it. Just listen to me. And I can hear the skeptic in the audience because the skeptic would be like, okay, so like what Christians are gonna teach about like emotional health Christians are crazy. Like, 
And I get that, and I think that that's fair to a certain extent. And I would challenge you with this. If the authority of the Bible isn't enough for you, uh, we still love you here and we want you here. And I would challenge you, what if you just tried it? What if you just went for it and did it and found out that it's real? What if you just did these three things, not for an hour, not for a day. What if you just did these three things for a month and found out that God is teaching you how to be emotionally and mentally healthy? Would you pray with me? God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for these uh, awesome people here who've gotten up. They've come over here to worship you and they've done that. They've worshiped your son. They've come over here to hear your word. They've come over here to be filled up with your spirit. I pray that all of those things and believe that all of those things are happening for each heart in this room. God, we're thinking of people in the room uh, who are struggling with mental health and emotional health and they so desperately want these things that we're talking about, but it just feels out of reach. Give them and bless them through the power of your spirit, the ability to do these things, God because we like mess it up all the time. And I just pray that you'd help us in that, Lord. And for the people who are going home to someone who's struggling with this and they just wish they were here at church and they wish that they would listen to this kind of stuff and believe this kind of stuff, but it's so hard. I just pray that you'd help them to bring the love of Christ and the content that they've learned this morning to those people and to help them. And I pray that they would receive it. And I pray that you'd bless some conversations today with some friends and colleagues and family who really need to learn how to have a healthy mind Jesus way. And lastly, God, I wanna pray a prayer of faith over this church. And I just pray, God, that you would bless us as we go into another school year. Bless us as we go out and serve. Bless us as we carry the good news of Jesus Christ into our homes, into our jobs. Bless us as we do these things, God. I pray that you would bless this church more than you ever have before with new salvations, with new baptisms. And we'll be very careful to give you all the glory, God. I pray that we'd have to buy more chairs. God, I pray that you would do something awesome at Cornerstone this year, and we'll be very careful to give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.